Foundation. Vicky. Good evening and welcome to the 2019 State of the Province Address. We are here in the, in the Ferguson Convention Center as guests are awaiting uh, for the introduction of Premier Blaine Higgs and for his speech. Uh, mon nom est Thomas Raffi and I am CEO of Conseil Economique du Nouveau-Brunswick. We're a network of entrepreneurs and businesses who contribute greatly to the province and to the community and they are the economic engine of New Brunswick. But before we hear from the Premier, I have the pleasure to talk to two guests and my first guest is the Honorable Ernie Steves, Minister of Finance and President of the Treasury Board. Thank you for joining us. Bonsoir. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Uh, Mr. Steves, uh, financial management is a priority for, for businesses. Uh, reducing the provincial debt and presenting a balanced budget, it will create consumer confidence and will allow also businesses to invest and expand and grow. Also, it will allow us also to offer services to all the citizens. You convinced me. Exactly. All right. <laughs> We're on the same page. Exactly. We're good. And we are. We're good We're already. We definitely are. I can say kind of making various surveys when we talk to the business community to tell us that you know, tackling the debt is, it must be a priority. And we saw the Auditor General's report in recent weeks that said this is, must be a priority. Mm -hmm. um, so what we want to see, and what we, the question for you is uh, how is the current government going to tackle the debt uh, and reduce it while offering the services? I think that our, our first capital budget, my first capital budget, I, I did that. I mean, I took what was projected to be an $866 million uh, budget and trimmed it down to about $600 million, and that was well received, and I think it's important. We've got the, we've got the future of New Brunswick to worry about here. Mm. Um, with this budget, the ordinary budget, I would call it an operating budget, but in government they call it an ordinary budget. Yes. Anyway, with this one, we'll drill down even further, and this goes down to, uh, to all the different departments. We've asked them to help us. We've asked them to find efficiencies, mm -hmm. which is good in any business, and, mm -hmm. and we've got to treat this a little bit like a business right now. Exactly. exactly. And treating it like a business, it's, it's very key. It's very int int interesting to hear that exactly, is yeah. to, to think like entrepreneurs and to actually, you know, the I use the word uh, ROI. I, I talk mm -hmm. about return on investment a lot. I said, exactly. guys, I got to see a positive ROI in all these things. No matter what we're doing, it has to be the best. Our customers are New Brunswickers, mm -hmm. are the citizens of New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. We've got to deliver them a product that is that is going to deliver a positive return on investment for them. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we're talking about the budget, the 2019-2020 uh, provincial budget. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm sure you know Premier Higgs would allude to the debt and you know and, yeah. and, and our, our spendings and also our, our revenues. Yeah. Uh, I know you won't tell us everything about the budget because we have to wait till March 19th, yeah. but yeah. what can you tell, what can you share tonight uh, that's in compared to previous budgets in the past? Like what, what will be different? What should we expect from this budget? You know what, it's going to be a different budget just in the fact that we've had successive governments spend and spend and spend mm -hmm. and not, uh, not necessarily try and tackle the debt at all. Mm -hmm. I am bound to determine to do that. I, uh, I will quote the, the health minister, Minister Fleming, who's, who said, you know what? I'm not going to be health minister forever, but I'm health minister right now. Yes. Well, I'm not going to be finance minister forever, but I'm finance minister right now. And right now, the key, I believe, for business, for the citizens of the province, is to tackle the debt, tackle the deficit, make sure we get a balanced budget, and, and try and pay down some of this debt, which is just massive. I mean, it, right now it's at the point where it's $40,000. Every household out there owes the equivalent of $40,000 because of the debt. We're, we're paying, it's the fourth largest line item we have. We're paying about $660 million a year just in service fees. It's just like interest fees on your, on your car loan, and that's without paying anything down. So it'd be like paying the interest on your car loan and not paying down the car loan itself, you know? Exactly. exactly. It's, a, it's a scary figure. It's the fourth largest item on the, on the line, and yeah, we've just got to get it tackled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we're talking about you know, the, the budget, especially the debt in itself. You know, mm -hmm. if we go on the other side, talking about revenues, you know, if we, how, how do we how do we increase revenues without taxing and without taxing businesses? How do we increase revenues? Uh, and, and well, uh, one of the ways I was really happy with the Auditor General's report a couple weeks ago because she talked about collections, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's funny because I had just before Christmas I started looking through things and I'm and I'm looking at different items. Were there loans? Were there not forgivable loans? These are loans, be it low interest or no interest loans, but they're still loans. Mm -hmm. Loans are meant to be paid back. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started a project and, uh, and I talked to, uh, to some of the staff uh, in the controller's office actually and, and I said, what are we doing about this? I said, there's some revenue there. It's not true revenue, but it's money that's owed to us and it's money that can help us balance the books. So let's look at that and, and there, are, there are ways out there to get that. We've got to get revenue that way. Mm -hmm got to get revenue by getting more businesses to set up shop in New Brunswick. We have to get more revenue by getting more immigrants in New Brunswick. We got to get revenue by just people enjoying their lives in New Brunswick and moving here. That's exactly. So population growth is definitely key. In, in, it has in to that be. Aspect. Exactly. It has to be. We're in desperate need of people who are 
nurses, uh, LPNs, we need uh, tons of people in IT, we need pe people in so many different... I heard the other day from, uh, from the Irving Group, they're, they're looking for people to work excavators and drive trucks, and it, it isn't just uh, IT persons and, and medical professionals, we need everybody, no matter what your skills are, we need you in New Brunswick. Exactly, all sectors. Uh, you know, you, you were mentioning how, you know, you, your term, you're talking about your term, but we have to also talk about long term, you know, yeah, long sure. term. What is, what is this government's, you know, long term vision when it comes to, to the financial health of our, of our province? One of the things that I, one of the first things I did was move us to a five year plan. Um, successive governments, whether that's us or somebody else, didn't have to abide by it, but when you're in business, I always made a five-year plan and I would, and I would uh, rejig that plan every, every couple of years or even sooner probably. But you got to have a five-year plan and so that's what we did. So we brought the five-year plan in. When I looked at the capital budgets over years past, I found that the happy medium seemed to be around 600 million. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I shot at and that's, that, was, that was the final goal is to get it and I think we got it at 602. But, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's what it is going to be for the next five years. So that so that uh, heavy road builders can plan and say, okay, how many people do I need this summer to hire to build the roads around New Brunswick? How many people in contractors do I need to build the buildings? They, they get to plan as well. They get to, to find out exactly where they're at and set their goals. And it's, uh, it helps, I think, if government does that, first of all. And so I have... Uh, I've, I've I've tried to do that as best I can. Yeah. And, you know, and, I, and, I've, and I've heard uh, you know, uh, the, the throne speech from Premier Higgs, and he says that everybody has to do their own fair share. Everybody's got to pull together. You know, and what, what, what does private sector need to do to, 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 to help and, and collaborate on, on that front? Bring more of your offices down here, <laughs> private sector. Um, uh, you know what? Help us identify who, who should be... Uh, who should we be looking for? Should there be uh, initiatives for training certain areas of the of the of the public? Do they uh, are there certain jobs that you need that you say? And you know what? If you're going to invest some money in post secondary education training and labor, and I'm not just saying just this, but I mean you know as one of the initiatives, maybe you want to how about this area because we're going to need this in the right in, in the soon. We're going to need trades like crazy here over the next few years. Um, we're just going to need workers, so that's what I would suggest. Private uh, enterprise, help us out. You know what? Get your get your head office to set up another office in exactly. another city, and, right. and let's grow New Brunswick. And I know there's a lot of I mean there's a lot of increases in cost of doing business, and also red tape that's that's in the way of businesses. And I know I'll talk with this with, with yeah. you know, Minister Wilson as well. But I, that's something that I know like, my businesses are very very uh, aware of this, and they're, they're, yeah. it's it's a challenge for them. Red tape is one of the one of the things that comes up a lot. Uh, we're having pre-budget consultations mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, um, and we've been talking to businesses, and we've been talking to unions, and we've been talking to social groups and, 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 and health. Tomorrow we're doing uh, some tourism, heritage, and culture stakeholders. Mm -hmm. uh, red tape is something that comes up regularly where, mm -hmm. where they really need to streamline government. And so we've got to sincerely and, and really honestly look at that and say, mm -hmm. Does this step need to be here? Because if it doesn't need to be here, then get rid of that. Mm -hmm. Let's go from A to B or A to C by skipping B. <laughs> exactly. Let's go right there because yeah. that's what we've got to do. So efficiency, efficiency, and looking at the numbers and looking at the returns on, on, on the investment, as you mentioned, the yeah. ROI. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, one, one, one last question just to, to talk about, as you mentioned, the, the revenues and you're looking at the, what are your thoughts also on export because we have to, we have to bring some, some revenue into, in, into this province mm -hmm. and we have to look not only outside of our borders and the south of the border, what are, what are your thoughts on, yeah. on the current situation when it comes to, to, to our exports, for example, in New Brunswick? Exports, uh, we're trying to develop as much as we can, but uh, the vast majority of our exports toward, you know, the go towards our GDP are from that refinery exactly. in St. John. Yeah. Um, uh, we've got to find whatever products we can. Come up with some original ideas. Think outside of the box. Mm -hmm. I, I encourage that in our in our government as well. We've got a lot of uh, a lot of new people who are MLAs who who, who haven't got into that government mold yet, and who will think outside of the box. Mm -hmm. Think about exciting opportunities for New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Talk to yourself mm -hmm. and other business people, and get them to say. What can we do different? Let's just look at something. Mm -hmm. Anything's on the table. Mm -hmm. Let's put everything on the table. Let's try and find a, a, something that will really work. Okay. Well, thank you. Excited. Well, thank you so much, uh, Minister you. Steves. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank you very you. much for your insight, for your comments, and your, your answers to the question, your insights on the 2019-2020 budget. We're looking yeah. forward to March 19th uh, yeah. to, to know have more details of the budget. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Bonne soirée. Okay. Merci. Well, the Premier will be uh, soon uh, giving his speech, but right before that, we will have our second guest. So if you're just tuning in, welcome and bienvenue. We are at the State of the Province Address uh, here in Ferryton at the Ferryton Convention Center. Uh, the Premier, the guests are 
are waiting for the introduction of the Premier for his speech. <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, I have the pleasure to talk to our guest. And our second guest is the Honorable Mary Wilson, Minister of Economic Development and Minister Responsible as well for Opportunities in New Brunswick. Correct. She is joining us. Uh, bonsoir. Good evening. Thank, Thank you for you. joining me. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to talk to you and talk about economic development. Yes, uh, it's exciting. And I know it's very dear to you due to your experience with uh, you know, organizations and, uh, right. that represent business owners. And to hear from uh, Minister Steves and from the Premier, private sector is, is, is of importance for your government. Indeed. The top priority energizing the private sector is uh, uh, number one, because we have to have a healthy independent sector to support the public sector. Mm -hmm. If you think about that in simple terms, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's what's going to make things work here in the province of New Brunswick. Um, as you had mentioned, my, my history over the last 20 years was working with an uh, independent business organization, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business here in uh, the Greater Fredericton area. And during these 20 years, I had the honor and pleasure of over 12,000 one-on-one meetings with local independent business owners. Mm -hmm. Every sector that you can think of, whether it's retail or professional, manufacturing, construction, service, I've met with farmers, truckers, they all just want to make a living, survive, create some jobs, and help our economy and, and keep their own business going. Yeah, and, and I know yourself and the Premier have said you, know, you want to make sure that New Brunswick is a great place to do business and to grow a business. And at Conseil exactly. Economique, we couldn't agree more. Exactly. Uh, but you know, however, that there is, there's been an increase of costs of doing business, a yes. lot of red tape that's been slowing down our businesses. So what is your government's plan to, to, to you know, control these increase of costs and also to alleviate the red tape? Yeah, well, we want to attack the red tape problem. Um, uh, under the Allward government, there was actually a measurement uh, by the departments here in the province of New Brunswick. There's over 52,000 regulatory uh, red tape issues that uh, we're up against here in the province of New Brunswick. So um, with the recent report card done by my previous organization, Manitoba and uh, Nova Scotia are leading the charge. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to look at what they're doing and uh, follow that lead. And we're going to put a team together and attack it. Like I was saying to many of the small business owners that I've dealt with over the years, You've told me time and again that um, you know, you're duplicating your efforts, you're wasting your time, something can be simplified. So now I want the examples from those small business owners. Exactly. They know what needs to be done so they can let us know and we'll do our best to fix it. Exactly. No, that's great. It's the approach of listening and also planning and coming with some actions. Uh, I have a question, you know, there's, there's been a study in 2015 done by David Campbell and Pierre-Marcel Desjardins mm -hmm. about economic bilingualism and its, its importance and benefits for our economy. Yes. Uh, you know, when we, when we think about the uh, contact center uh, industry the sector that creates, that generates $1.4 billion for our economy yes. and also the 15,000 jobs created mm -hmm. uh, in, in the province, uh, I would like to know your, your, your government's uh, you know, position and thoughts on, on the importance of economic bilingualism as an asset for our economy. That's a huge asset. We are the only bilingual province in Canada. Yeah. So how can you argue with that? Mm -hmm. What a draw for mm -hmm. businesses that want to come here and have unilingual, bilingual, multilingual um, uh, workforce exactly. to work with. So exactly. uh, we can't go wrong there. It can only enhance that draw for people to come here. Mm -hmm. So on top of that draw and that benefit that we've got, we also have to be tax friendly and red tape friendly. Mm -hmm. So uh, we dealt with several increases as of recent, as mm -hmm. you and your members mm -hmm. will be aware. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest one recently being WorkSafe New Brunswick. Exactly. Terrible. Exactly. Exactly. You know, uh, the rates have been going up very quickly mm -hmm. and by large numbers mm -hmm. over recent years. Um, and sadly, you know, the previous government could have made a move mm -hmm. last summer, but mm -hmm. chose not to. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we got elected yes. on November the 2nd and given the nod to run this yes. province the next day, exactly. Saturday at yes. 11 o'clock, yes. Premier Higgs had work safe <laughs> at his office. What can we do to make things better now? So we're and moving on that. Exactly. And it's a great example of how, you know, there was a committee that, that actually, you know, brought some reports, some recommendations, right. and you actually acting on it. And there, there needs to be some legislative changes, and changes are actually happening. So it's very comforting and to, to right. see that in, in that front. And it, it's been very hard also for businesses as you manage because it forces them to make choices, expand or not expand, hire new people or not. And that's, you, you can't, you know, Absolutely. plan that way. I could, hear, I could hear the brakes coming on exactly. in the fall as exactly. soon as those rates were announced. Exactly. You knew, and they knew trouble was yep. coming, so we have to, we had to get on it right away. Definitely. So uh, Definitely. Premier Higgs wants results, mm -hmm. he wants them 
as quickly as possible. So we're going to continue to move on that. There are other issues that are plaguing small businesses right now too. Uh, it's a federal issue, but it affects all of us. Mm. And January 1, Canada pension premiums started exactly. going up. Exactly. And they're going up every year for the next yep. five years yep. to the yep. tune of 20%. Mm. A lot of people don't even know that's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they'll notice it when their paycheck starts to get a little bit mm -hmm. smaller. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's another profit insensitive payroll tax on top of C uh, WorkSafe New Brunswick, mm -hmm. on top of employment insurance mm -hmm. premiums. Mm -hmm. So those are the issues that have to be attacked. Exactly. Because and they can't hire and grow if those payroll taxes keep plaguing them. Exactly. And then you have other factors that's outside of the control of, of businesses. We're talking about carbon pricing, carbon tax. Yes. We, we still don't know exactly. how this is going to play out. Terrifying. So uh, who's going to, you know, they're sitting back right now. And, and so we have to give them that uh, encouragement and confidence that mm -hmm. we're going to work hard to make things better. One of the good things that we are uh, going to be working on here in the province of New Brunswick is to work towards reducing mm. and gradually eliminating the double property taxation oh, for yes. commercial businesses and yes. residential cottages, yes. Yes. you have yes. a rental property. Exactly. Yep. Um, so that's a huge disincentive for businesses to come here to New Brunswick. Why would you come here if we have the only province that says we have double property taxation? Exactly. Yeah. So it's been an issue on the table for many yes. years. Yes. So now we're going to start seeing some movement. And I'm excited great. to see that's great. how and when all that's going to start. That, that's great. That's very encouraging, it definitely, is. for a private sector. Another question, let's talk about, you know, uh, export. And, yes. you know, we saw in the last year the renegotiation of NAFTA. We saw how the softwood lumber dispute is still not resolved. We have to diversify our markets. We have to look somewhere else. We can't only rely on our neighbor down uh, south of the border. Indeed. Uh, we have to look at other markets. You are also the minister responsible for opportunities in New Brunswick. Yes. So we'd like to hear your thoughts, your government's thoughts on, you know, first of all, making sure that our businesses are export ready. That's that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But also looking to make sure that we are act, you know, active globally with that's right. Europe to and, diversify. and Asia. Exactly. exactly. So $13 billion a year in exports going out. Uh, yes, uh, the United States, 90% of where our exports uh, are going. Mm -hmm. So we do absolutely have to diversify. And Opportunities in New Brunswick is doing a good job mm -hmm. and that's where um, a lot of concentration will be and looking at other markets because New Brunswick has to be able to do more exactly. and we have to help them do that. Exactly. Um, I mean especially we have an agreement signed, you know, Canada has an agreement signed with the European Union, we have to yes. make sure we maximize this and this, there's a lot of need to, I think to inform first of all our businesses to make yes. sure they're aware of the opportunities that are available to them. Right? Exactly and on a local note mm. um, um, intergovernmental trade right here in our own country is important and we have barriers from province to province to province mm -hmm. so there has to be some work more work mm -hmm. done in that area it's pretty bad when it's cheaper to import or export something <laughs> to France than it is to Nova Scotia exactly. yeah, what definitely. is wrong with this picture yeah, definitely. so definitely. so again Nova Scotia by the way is doing a great job on reducing red tape mm -hmm. and opening up the borders and mm -hmm. we're gonna mm -hmm. follow suit in the very near future and then we're looking forward to it Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you so much for answering these questions. Okay. And it's great to hear your insight and also the direction that the government will take when it comes to supporting private sector. Thank, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Merci pleasure. beaucoup. Bonne soirée. Okay. Ça conclut ainsi nos, uh, nos, notre, nos, nos questions. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in with us. This was our, our questions with the ministers. Now we're going to uh, join the crowd that's in the, in the floor for the introduction of uh, Premier Blaine Higgs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening. Au revoir. Uh, New Brunswick is a beautiful province, which indeed it is. I also don't say it because we enjoy and appreciate the business we do here. I'm especially excited to be here because our ongoing collaborations in New Brunswick are creating some of the most dynamic innovations we have seen anywhere around the globe. We are really making an impact at the global stage. New Brunswick offers this unique combination of innovation and collaboration, and that is why I want to be here and that is why I want my company to be here. It is this incredible story of innovation that Siemens Global is committed to continue its investments in this province. Our collaborations with NB Power, with the University of New Brunswick, with ONB, with ACOA, provincial and federal agencies, created the Smart Grid Innovation Network. And I tell you, this is really unique in the world uh, this network has three research and development labs, and anyone with the ambition to develop, market, and export smart grid products and solutions is welcome to use these labs. We believe that such cooperations between public, private, and academic are key to fostering a strong future for Atlantic Canada and Canada. 
These partnerships provide local vendors with new market opportunities and attract investment. And now we are exporting these innovations around the world and truly influencing smart grid development around the globe as well. It would not be an exaggeration to say that New Brunswick is becoming a world leader when it comes to smart grid innovation. And our efforts have been recognized by the federal government. Just last week at the World Economic Forum at Davos and also in Atlantic region, the government of Canada announced a 35.6 million grant funding for the Smart Grid Atlantic project through its Strategic Innovation Fund. Here, Siemens, New Brunswick Power, and Nova Scotia Power will together develop and de demonstrate groundbreaking technologies which will serve the energy management needs of the communities, of utilities, and also the individual consumers. So as you may know, the electric energy sector is in the early stages of a major disruption. Decentralized, low-cost generation, coupled with energy storage, along with the future electrification of the transportation sector, will fundamentally change the business models of this sector. And the technological architecture of the grid will also be changed. With the Smart Grid Atlantic Initiative, Siemens Canada and our partners have the opportunity to create the grid of the future right here in the Atlantic region. And, and we have secured our place at the forefront of innovation of this dynamic and rapidly changing space. So I would, on behalf of Siemens Canada, like to thank our tremendous partners, uh, New Brunswick Power, Nova Scotia Power, I know Mira, Mira is here, for the efforts for co-creating the Smart Grid Atlantic Initiative together with us. I'd also like to thank the Atlantic business community and the university who have supported us in this endeavor. So despite all these successes uh, and these strong collaborations, uh, we are not content. It's not that we are difficult people. Uh, it's because there's more to do. And the world keeps on changing. And we have said that we here in Atlantic Canada want to be the leader as far as smart grid is concerned global leaders for smart grid. And if we have this ambition, we also have to be leaders in cybersecurity. That's why we recently announced that Siemens will build a global center of, center of cybersecurity right here in Fredericton. Uh, actually, we... Okay. So we, the project has already started, and uh, we have already a six-man highly specialized experts in our team. We plan to triple the, the numbers by the end of the year. In fact, our cybersecurity team is growing so fast that we had to take an additional table today. So that's the cybersecurity team, which was, by the way, not in the budget, but. Well, <laughs> so anyway, cybersecurity is one of the most important challenges facing businesses and institutions in 2019. We all know, and without naming the companies, that data of millions of users was compromised last year. So yes, cybersecurity is important. Globally, 58% of the companies reported some sort of cyber breach. And the situation may be even worse, because there's a recent study which shows that nine out of 10 Canadian companies had some sort of cyber incidents in the last 12 months. The cost of cyber attacks is estimated to be $600 billion per year. That's 1% of the global GDP. So although there has been some good progress in the cybersecurity of information technology, which we call IT cybersecurity, but there is a lot of work still to be done when it comes to protection of critical infrastructure, which we call cybersecurity of operational technologies, or OT cybersecurity. Because machines, factories, and smart grids are just as vulnerable to cyber attacks as conventional, conventional computer systems. So Siemens is proud to be a world leader in the war against cyber attacks. We have 30 years of experience. We have 1,300 employees globally. And in fact, we are a founding member of the Charter of Trust. Uh, it is a powerful global initiative where like-minded companies 
like Cisco and Airbus have come together, and we ourselves, without any regulation, have committed that we will produce all our future products and solution to very stringent and strong cybersecurity principles. So I'm pleased to announce that over the next two months, we will be launching multiple research and development initiatives uh, here in our cybersecurity center in the Knowledge Park. And this to ensure that there is cutting edge expertise available in this field today and tomorrow for New Brunswick and for the rest of Canada. As part of this new commitment, just this morning we announced that Siemens is now a corporate member of the Canadian Institute of Cybersecurity at the University of Browns uh, UNB at the University of New Brunswick. We are also working closely with NB Power and CN, uh, Cyber NB and other partners in the ecosystem on a very ambitious project to develop a comprehensive protection mechanism for New Brunswick critical infrastructure. And I would like to really commend Cyber NB for their leadership in this initiative. So we at Siemens Canada are grateful that we got the opportunity to acknowledge our great partners, New Brunswick Power, University of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia Power, and the federal and the provincial governments here. We are also very grateful that I have the opportunity to say that New Brunswick has an amazing ecosystem when it comes to technology, research and development, and innovation. So thank you for that. So now it's my, my pleasure to introduce Honorable Premier Blaine Higgs, First elected to the Legislative Assembly on September 27, 2010, Blaine Hicks served as a Minister of Finance from 2010 to 2014. He was re-elected in 2014 and then in 2018, representing the riding of Quis Pamsis. I hope I pronounced it right. <laughs> so, in 2016, he was elected leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of New Brunswick. Born in Woodstock, Premier Higgs graduated from the University of New Brunswick with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering. That's good. <laughs> a lot of, lot of engineers, so it's not bad. <laughs> Following university, he joined Irving Oil, where he held numerous positions of increasing responsibility in engineering, refining, refining operations, and in the transportation sector. Prior to his retirement in 2010, he was Director of Logistics and Distribution with overall responsibility for the transportation and bulk storage system for the reliable supply of refined products to customers throughout Eastern Canada and New England. He also served on the Board of Directors for Canaport LNG and the New Brunswick Gateway Council. Premier Hicks has traveled extensively for business and for pleasure, and the insights learned through his interactions with different cultures provides him with an appreciation for the challenges that New Brunswick faces in the global economy. As a long-time resident of Chris Pamses, he's married to Marsha, and the couple have four daughters, Lindsay, Laura, married to Reed Gilmore, Sarah, married to Jeff Wilkinson, and Rachel, married to Matt Hiltz. They are also blessed with four grandchildren, Nadia, Alexander, Samuel, and Sadie. He was sworn as the Premier of New Brunswick on November 9th, 2018. Before we welcome the Premier on to the stage, uh, let's take a moment and watch this video. Thank you. Thank you. Bienvenue au bureau du Premier ministre. Welcome to the Premier's office. All his life, except for the few months he was born before me. <laughs> You're making a point that he's older than he's older than me. Yes. And I can tell you about his birthday cakes that his mother made for him. <laughs> I can tell you how he drove from uh, yes. one side of the snowbank to the other side on his jet ski or snow jet. No. Both wagons. <laughs> Lots of good memories. About the horses and the kids. He's a very results oriented person. And uh, people perhaps don't truly understand what that means because we've never really talked like that. But we desperately needed 
uh, we desperately need to, uh, when we make decisions, know that we're going to produce results. And we've not had that for a long time. Moi, ce qui est venu me chercher dans mes premières rencontres avec Blaine Higgs, c'est qu'il voit... The interpreter apologizes. We don't have accompli. a feeling. Puis, euh, lorsque je, moi, je, voulais, je désirais d'être le ministre du Tourisme, j'ai vu un sourire euh, chez M. Higgs. Donc, moi, ça m'a parlé beaucoup. Il voit aussi l'importance de la culture. Il est venu nous voir au pays de la Saguenay du temps que j'étais là. Il croit dans la culture et le développement touristique. Et euh, ça ne peut pas mieux tomber pour nous. Pour moi, c'est un grand honneur de travailler avec Blaine Higgs. C'est quelqu'un qui est complètement honnête, euh, des fois peut-être un peu trop honnête. Il va toujours dire la, la vérité, même quand c'est difficile. Et tu sais, quand tu parles avec euh, le premier ministre, que quand il te dit quelque chose, il va livrer. He says things as they are. Uh... Let's face it, he's an engineer. He, he often sees it as a very logical uh, person. He likes to play tricks on me. Go on, is that the website? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was a commitment that we said we would fulfill what he had said before. In fact, it... He wants to be premier because he wants a better province for his kids and his grandkids. He would love them to come back. Uh, three of his daughters are not in this province, not living in this province at the moment. But he would just love them to come back here to stay in New Brunswick. notice about Blaine and what attracted me to him was his sense of humor and after our first date I told my parents that he, he makes me laugh and he He has a very much a sense of duty and if there's if someone has a cottage a, a lady near us and uh, he's if he only has a, a little bit of time he will do something for someone else. Mesdames et Messieurs, notre Premier ministre, ladies and gentlemen, our Premier, the Honorable Blaine Higgs. Merci beaucoup. Firstly, you know, that's the first, I, first time I've seen that video. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it is touching because there's so many experiences you go through in, uh, in life and, and in, in it to be at this position. But something I'll draw your attention to, I'm glad it's not up there right now, but I'm kind of wondering how many people noticed it. You know, I've started a lot of things late in life. And one of them was, was playing hockey. And so I never started playing hockey until I was 33 years old. And, and I was uh, basically, we were starting the church team, and they said, look, could you stay after church, anyone who wants to play hockey, and, and we're going to start a league in St. John. And I said, you know, I, I'll do that. I, um, I would like to play hockey. So I came back at the end. We all talked, and they had a forward, they had defense, they had center. They didn't have a goalie. I said, well, I'll, I'll play net. So no one asked me if I'd ever played net. They just, they just need a goalie. And I thought, well, I'm big enough. I'll be able to fit in between the pipes. So I realized the pipes were wider than I thought. And so I had my first game, and I got my equipment on, took it home, boarded it, and went, got my first game, and, and, and we won, 15 to 14. <laughs> the other guy wasn't any good either. So, 
So that shot you saw in the hockey rink, that was boot hockey just, just, just a few weeks ago at, uh, up at the lake. And when we had, uh, the night before that, we would actually had a, a New Year's Eve. My mom was 98 on the December 31st. So we had, uh, we played a little tournament on the ice. And so I was playing goalie once again. But that net, that is good. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I just had to be there. But I had a goals against average of three when I was really playing with a real net, and I still had an average of three with that one. So anyway, I, hockey wasn't my career. So firstly, I just want to say, uh, bonsoir mes amis, c'est un plaisir pour moi d'être ici avec vous ce soir. It's a pleasure for me soir. to be here it's, with uh, you. It's an honor for me to be here tonight. Every day since our government was sworn in, I felt the honor, the history, and the heavy responsibility that comes with the job of Premier. But as a great an honor it is to be here, first and foremost, the Premier is a citizen of this province. Je remercie la Chambre de Commerce d'avoir organisé cette Commerce, event Commerce for organizing this event once again this year. In a world of tweets and sound bites, this remains one chance for the Premier to speak directly to citizens and explain the plan for restoring the New Brunswick dream. Ce soir, je vous, I want je vais vous to explain mission that mission to you, and I humbly ask your support. Some people ask me why I would take this job on at this stage in my life. The answer is simple, really. My wife thought she couldn't live with me in retirement. <laughs> she said that, you know, with all I learned in finance, with all the experiences that I've learned over the years, it was an opportunity to put that to work. And I could enjoy retirement. I like a lot of things. I, I'd like to volunteer, spend more time snowmobiling, skiing in the winter, and in the motorcycle. We had on our bucket list a trip across Canada on the motorcycle. By the time I get ready for that, you know, it's going to be tense. But that's, that's why they invented spiders, though, isn't it? A spider's a three-railed motorcycle, for those of you that don't know. We could spend more time with grandchildren. But I've delayed that retirement with the hopes of making a difference right here in New Brunswick. I want to ensure that we have the options to stay in New Brunswick, the options that I had when I graduated many years ago. I want others to fulfill the New Brunswick dream, the very dream that Marsh and I fulfilled with our kids growing up right here in this province. I stand here tonight because we were blessed with that dream. I got a top-notch education in New Brunswick. And so I appreciate your comments about mechanical engineering. Yes, indeed, yes. Uh, I'm <laughs> the engineering group over here. I married my high school sweetheart, Marcia. We raised four beautiful children, and we built a career that we are both proud of. My kids grew up in close proximity to their grandparents, and I'm still fortunate enough to drive home to Forest City on weekends, well, not as many weekends as there used to be, to visit my 98-year-old mother. Now, now, your New Brunswick dream may be different than mine. It should be. For starters, you can't marry Marcia. She's still with me. <laughs> but whatever your dream is, you should be able to live it at home, in the place you love, working with the people you love. My commitment to you is to do everything in my power with the team that we have to ensure that we have that opportunity to do that right here in New Brunswick. I haven't always followed the usual, usual political path. In the leadership race and in the election, I avoided making costly promises. I started this job with no IOUs to supporters or no expensive big-ticket election promises to voters. Some of you I know wrote us off. Last year, even Marshall, you know, kind of gave me a shot about our finances, said that, well, I am selling chocolate bars out in the, out in the foyer and encouraged everyone to buy. It worked. <laughs> Thank you, Marshall. <laughs> and <laughs> in addition, you know, as we moved on through the year, we added important options, which you've already mentioned. First order business, get chocolate milk back. <laughs> New Brunswickers sent a clear message in this election. One, as Marshall pointed out, we haven't seen for 100 years, but one we need to pay attention to. Nous sommes le premier ministre gouvernement minoritaire. This is in New Brunswick, the first minority this, government in almost a century. New Brunswick, New Brunswick decided to send a clear message that they do not want politics as usual. That suits me just fine. I believe that too often politics gets in the way of good government. 
We have seen a lot of decisions that were driven by the next headline, or the next question period, or the next election. Our team made a commitment to each other and to New Brunswick. We will have evidence drive our decisions, not the other way around. Usually a new government rushes off all of its projects and spending into the first year so they can run up a bigger deficit and blame it on the past government. We did not do that. We sent a clear message to credit rating agencies and investors by controlling spending in this fiscal year, in addition to the decisions made in the capital budget. We took immediate action on crucial issues. We lowered work safe premiums that were devastating to businesses. We met the ambulance crisis head on, working with our colleagues and found solutions that save lives and respect language rights. We reviewed early child care programs and kept them. We didn't ask whose idea was it. We asked if the long-term return on investment was there and worth it. As I share our mission with you here tonight, I want to show you a couple of things that truly jumped out at me upon taking office. The first, in the last four years, government took in a billion dollars more in revenue than it did in 2014. A billion dollars per year, mostly through higher taxes. That's a lost opportunity. We continue to borrow money to pay our bills. Yet, we were second last in Canada in economic growth. Our social program indicators from literacy scores to child poverty rates to surgical wait times did not improve. A billion dollars is a lot of money. It's nearly 3,000 for every working person in New Brunswick. We are incredibly reliant upon public money to keep the economy going. And that is the problem. If an economic plan is built around taking another billion dollars in taxes from a workforce of 320,000 people every time things get tough, you don't have an economic plan. We will not be raising new taxes for government coffers. I have a graph here I'd like to draw your attention to, and I have a laser pointer, but I'm just waiting for an opportunity to use this for a long time. Basically, and it still works, this is good. Uh, basically, the, the, what I want to show you here is looking back to our 2008 range, seven, you, you've seen where public sector, so this is public sector spending right here in the deep blue, and this is, this, or sorry, public sector in the gray. The, the deep blue, it's, it's private sector. So you can see the differential was about two to one, and it should be that way. There should be more public, or more private sector spending than public sector spending by a factor about two to one. Look what's happened over the years. We had a peak here, um, and then you see where we are now. Public sector and private sector spending is matching. That is not a future for sustainable economic growth. And if that goes the other way even more, then you become a situation where less people are paying more to finance projects, projects to create employment, projects that are invented. That's not innovation. That's a recipe to continue spiraling into a deep hole. This slide clearly shows the challenge. Si notre économie continue de coûter uniquement sur les dépenses publiques, nous demanderons à... If our economy continues to rely upon only public spending, then we'll be asking fewer and fewer people to pay more and more. That discourages people from starting businesses, taking risks, hiring people, and paying taxes. Often we look around our communities and we look for, look for hospitals and schools and arenas. Those are important, but they are not generators of wealth. They are the benefits we get when we have a strong economy that generates wealth and gets people working and paying taxes. The corner store, the family business, the local car dealership, these all generate more wealth than hospitals. They generate the private wealth that pays for public services. Our goal is simple. We want to grow the private economy so it can pay the public services that we want and that we need. And in the process, we want to reduce your taxes. That's the goal. Let's talk about what each of us can do to get there. To leave, to leave the New Brunswick dream intact for the next generation, we have to do something government does not always do. We have to act with urgency. Our Auditor General recently confirmed that New Brunswickers have more public debt per capita than Canadians anywhere else. And New Brunswickers carry one of the highest tax burdens in Canada. 
When a government that takes more taxes from you and hands more debt to your children and hasn't delivered results in health or education or environment protection, environmental protection or child poverty, that is not a call to set up a study or convene a focus group. It's a call to action. It's a call to action with a sense of urgency. It's a call to clean up our finances urgently. It's a call to improve critical government services urgently. It's a call for a forestry management plan that ensures sustainability in an environmentally acceptable way, urgently. It's a call for a softwood lumber agreement that ensures our businesses can survive and thrive, not always on the verge, depending on the U.S. dollar exchange or the market itself. It's a call to measure results and hold government accountable, urgently. And it's a call to lower taxes, urgently. In politics as usual, governments only discover their sense of urgency as election days draw closer. We are trying to create a culture in government where the sense of urgency is not driven by our own political mortality, but by our passion for New Brunswick's future. How many people listening tonight have had friends say to them, I can't make it to retirement, but my kids are already looking elsewhere. And even worse, how many parents have said to their kids, you need to leave New Brunswick to succeed? In fact, we can succeed right here in New Brunswick, and that is the goal we're starting now. In the next 10 years, about 120,000 jobs will open up here in New Brunswick. That will be like having to replace the entire greater St. John area with new people in the next decade. For the first time in my working career, we will have more jobs than people, and it will be that way for a long time. About 75,000 of those jobs will require some kind of post-secondary education. If you took the whole campus here in Fredericton, UNB, STU, NBCC, CCNB, we would need six of them to fill the demand. However, it's our education focused on the needs. Do we have the right programs to meet the demands? I have been told the NBCC campus right here in Fredericton has a waiting list of 300 individuals waiting to enroll in the LPN program, a critical skill requirement for the future. So I say, what are we waiting for? We see the demands, we see the need, let's react and find a solution. That may be one benefit of being an engineer. I do like results. I like a plan. I like a Gantt chart. I like to know who's responsible. I like to know when it's going to happen. And I like to know it's going to happen now. That's the difference between us and accountants. <laughs> uh, I hope there aren't too many accountants here. I'm sorry about that. Notre défi est de savoir comment nous pouvons fournir les services. provide the necessary services with fewer people being available. It will be less and less a financial issue, but more a, of a people issue. The companies that hire people will go to the places that have the people who can do the work. If we have too few people to take those jobs, those employers go elsewhere. We need dreamers and doers to choose New Brunswick. That's the key to keeping the New Brunswick dream alive. I see a province small enough to collaborate and innovate, but one capable of dreaming big. That province is New Brunswick. But I also see another province, one where too often politics have trumped evidence in public policy, one where public services are seen as vehicles to create jobs instead of public trust to improve public health and literacy. I see a province that has said yes to taxes and no to industry so often that we are sending the next generation out west and beyond to do jobs that we've turned away right here at home. We are indeed at a crossroads. The province we choose to be in the next five years will determine whether or not my grandchildren, your grandchildren, your children see a space for their dreams right here in New Brunswick. We can keep demanding more taxes from fewer workers, but soon we will have fewer and fewer people paying more taxes because government has to keep spending and paving, that's not a typo, and subsidizing just to keep the illusions of a strong economy. Well, I'll tell you, there are no illusions 
coming forward from this government. We will speak what we see, we will speak what we learn, what we know, and we'll make decisions based on the facts that justify them. In 10 years, in 10 years, we could reach a point where one person is generating taxes for every one person who is paid from the public purse. And at that point, it gets very hard to avoid a spiral of borrowing, taxing, and watching private businesses leave. Or we can bet on the creativity and the drive of New Brunswickers. We can create condition that makes success possible for everyone who has had an idea, takes a risk, or starts a business without help from others. A premier can provide facts and urge changes, but the kind of province we will be ultimately be depends not on the government we elect, but the people that we are. I'm calling on each one of us to ask, how can we each lead this change? We need a new attitude that replaces what do I get with what can I do? Every time we ask government to do something, we should ask, 30 years from now, will my grandchildren be glad that this decision was made? That is the era of big citizenship that I'm calling for here tonight. At the first minister's meeting, I talked a lot about equalization. I want you to know this. I will never, ever fail to defend our interest in the front of any audience that I face. We will always tell our story and never shrink from asking for the tools we need to move forward. But equalization is not an end to itself. I did not get into politics to make life more comfortable for us to be a have-not province. I got into politics to get us off the list of being a have-not province. Equalization is a tool. Equalization is a tool, but the goal is a world where we do not need it. We do not want to live in fear of the decisions of others. I want to drive that part home. Right now, 36% of our budget comes from federal transfer payments. That means that huge parts of our economy and our social safety net depends on decisions that others make. Tomorrow, the equivalent of our entire health care system could be removed by the decision of others. New Brunswickers deserve the security of having a strong economy that can pay for public services we choose to have. It starts by getting control of our deficits and our debt. We... we pay seven cents out of every tax dollar in interest on our debt. That money does not stay here at home. It goes to bondholders outside New Brunswick and outside Canada. Small decisions on interest rates made by others can affect our ability to fund schools and hospitals. One reason I was so concerned when we received the credit downgrade warning last year is because I know the human cost of that. A downgrade in our credit overnight means that we spend hundreds of millions more on board money to service a debt that, that we already have. Notre gouvernement vous contrôle les dépenses. Our government wants to control spending and borrowing so that New Brunswickers control their future. When others give or loan us money, they get control. That's why standing up for New Brunswick does not mean asking others for money. It means demanding fairness, and we are going to stand up for New Brunswick. We will continue to fight the job-killing carbon tax imposed on us by the federal government. The carbon tax debate is not between those who want to deal with climate change and those who do not. In our speech from the throne, we were clear that we accept that climate change is real, man-made and worthy of action. But the federal carbon tax is expensive, bureaucratic and ineffective. It is also applied differently across the provinces. Why, for instance, does the federal plan make gas 16 cents a litre more expensive in Sackville than 10 minutes away in Amherst? For the federal Liberals, it's a revenue generator, not a climate policy, to the tune of $1,200 per year more in New Brunswick family will pay when fully implemented. We do not oppose the carbon tax because we are absent in the fight for a cleaner environment. We know we can meet the emission targets without taxing people more, and our goal is to meet the emission, tax, emission targets, and our goal is to fight the tax. With a carbon tax, Everything you buy will be more expensive, and you will get a pre-election check from the federal government just in time before the election to buy your vote. 
but it won't cover all expenses. We're also going to stand up for free trade and fair trade across Canada. We will happily open our markets for others, but I will expect other provinces to follow suit. It shocked me to learn, for example, that Quebec has 45 mandatory trade certification for skilled workers that allow them to insist upon only hiring locally. New Brunswick has 12 such certifications. Now, what does that mean? It means that Quebec workers can work in New Brunswick, but New Brunswick workers cannot work in Quebec. That's not fair. I've been very vocal. I've been very vocal about my frustration over Alberta's stranded oil supply. I'm going to break it down for you tonight. Alberta is no surprise, has been feeding our families here in New Brunswick and elsewhere in the country for years with their profits from oil export, exports. I expected that to be an item of urgency, a crisis, in the first minister's meeting back in, the, in December. But it wasn't. It wasn't even on the agenda. Well, we put it on the agenda. And it became a topic. But there was no interest from Quebec to even consider it. There was no interest for a utility energy corridor where we would have a national strategy, much like this, the railroad years and years ago. Now that a resource is stranded because it doesn't have a pipeline to move it to market, Alberta is losing $80 million a day on its oil. And anyone who thinks that won't eventually affect every province, including New Brunswick, who is being paid by the money from those resources, who, in transfer payments, we're fooling ourselves. That is why we are working to build a national coalition of provinces who see the importance of a pipeline, of an energy corridor, to transition into fuels, into a, a clean energy environment. Provinces have a responsibility to each other to allow every Canadian to choose energy from Canadian producers rather than rely upon the cost and moral compromises of foreign oil. I know that Quebec wants to look at transmission lines to allow them to sell electricity to New England, and so they should, and we would like to work with them on that. And as a Canadian, I want that for them too. But it can't be a one-way street. It can't be all for one. It's got to be that we work together for the right reasons. We're all part of Canada. We're all part of a nation that we want strong. And this province, this province that was so strong and helped to finance the, the central Canada many years ago, the Bank of Nova Scotia, formed in 1832 or somewhere in that range in, in Halifax. I mean, we have a history here of an economy and a strength, and now we're kind of left on the tail end of the country. Well, our days are, are going to change because our voice is going to be heard. I cannot be bought. If province want access to our grids and our terror to move the stranded assets, I will expect equal, equal concern for them for our economic future. The prospect of the corridor, which I mentioned. When I say we need to grow our economy and create an opportunity, that means for everyone. You know, I want to note here tonight, when the presence of the, the regional chief, Roger Augustine, who's here, and the chief, uh, Ken Barlow, I believe, as well as other First Nations chiefs. I'm not sure where you are, but you're here tonight. And I want to make special note because I see the elected First Nations governments as true partners in what we are trying to accomplish. As First Nation governments deserve the autonomy to make their own decisions and work with us for the prosperity of New Brunswick. One area that we can work together is in the management of our salmon stocks. We will be asking the federal government to allow for management of our rivers and local fisheries at the provincial level. I believe with the council and traditional knowledge of First Nations, we can do a better job of management of declining salmon stock here than has ever been done from Ottawa. And I look forward to working with elected First Nations leaders towards a new, less paternalistic approach to governing where First Nations can truly manage their local economies. We need to look at industrial exploration and movement. We need to look at resource development. We need to look at best forestry practice. There's such an opportunity for us to work together with one goal in mind, and that's rebuilding, fixing, and seeing a brand New Brunswick that brings people home. Now, I want to talk. I want to talk about something that I call 50 cent dollars. You've probably heard me mention that before. I'm calling on the federal government to provide support for priorities that move our economy forward. 
We need to change the belief that every dime or every time Ottawa offers us a 50-50 funding project, we need to take the deal or we are losing money. That doesn't sound like a bargain to me, something that I don't need, but I must spend money to get it. That sounds like a quick way to lose control of your own spending and your own priorities. If you had to buy a big screen TV every time Walmart offered you a 50 cent discount, you wouldn't be a smart shopper, but you certainly have a lot of TVs. <laughs> and you'd have a big debt. Offering 50 cent dollars is a way for Ottawa to control our spending around their priorities, not New Brunswickers. And that's the difference. We have priorities, we have a voice, and we want help, but we want help in where we need it. Their needs are driven by federal election cycle, not the need to provide quality education in Doketown and a good seniors care in Shippen. Our government will be challenging Ottawa to develop a funding model that makes them true partners to help maintain the infrastructure the, uh, we already have the highest per capita in the country, miles of roads. The number one way we can achieve financial independence comes from developing our own natural resources. We have already started removing barriers for communities like Sussex that want the opportunities of natural gas development. Natural gas development is happening safely in nearly every other Canadian province, including British Columbia. And when I was in British Columbia, I met with Premier Horgan, and he was talking about the big project that was being built. $42 billion private sector investment of an LNG export facility. He was talking about their shale gas that they've been developing and, and, ex and exploiting for the last 30, 40, 50 years. And you know, it's strange that here we have a province that can't figure out what's already being done across this country. And did you know that Alberta has more than 480,000 natural gas wells? It's time to stop making decisions for our province based on fear and start making decisions based on facts. Pour moi, the fond de la Nouvelle Brunswick. For me, standing up for New Brunswick does not mean getting cash from others and giving up control. Standing up for New Brunswick means fighting for a fair chance to compete create a competitive business environment and open markets for our people, goods, and ideas. New Brunswick will become the province to watch, not the province to finance or buy off in exchange for support. I'm often asked why I'm confident that we can lower the tax burden for New Brunswickers, get our spending under control, and still improve the results of public service. It's not because I'm an, I'm, I'm an optimist, but I am. It's also because I've seen the opportunities for improvement. I believe we can have an approach to governing that encourages good decisions and empowers public servants to unleash your creativity and talents. Let me give you some examples. I recently had a chance to speak to the mayor of Moncton, Don Arnold, and she showed me something very interesting, how much it has cost her community to build a road to a new school built several years ago. So if we're putting new schools, if we're putting hospitals, if we're putting infrastructure, we need to have the municipalities have a voice. Where should it go? When should it be built? And how should it be built? We shouldn't just plunk it down because it's a politically correct thing to do. So that's one reason we'll work urgently with local governments, reforms so that we can work with municipalities and improve the way they do their business because we're going to react to the needs that they have. Decisions should be made at the level closest to the community. They are the ones who can best see all of those unintended consequences. And we need to take the politics out of procurement, whether it's choosing building sites, renting offices, or trusting our asset management system to maintain our roads and infrastructure. I've had a chance to hear from a number of people who are trying to make the transition from social assistance to work. We have 36,000 people on social assistance. Roughly 20% are below the age, are, are tw yeah, 20% are, are below, have a, are below 10,000 in that range, or below the age of 20. Many of them would love to be working and paying taxes, but our system doesn't allow that. They can't do a great job if they don't get the right support. I've talked to employers who've had jobs sitting open because they can't find employees. I've asked them. What if government helped? What if we found a way to help people help themselves? 
What if we committed to offering employment to people on social assistance? Would they do that? Would they do that in a way that we don't claw back the, the money that's there? We actually encourage people to want to be part of the workforce, to create a future that I'm sure every individual wants to do for themselves. Because no one, no one wants to be on the system just to be there. And the business said, yes, we'll participate. We've talked about it long enough. It's time to put action, put some people on it to work and help them to succeed. A lot of families get trapped with low rents or family incomes in locations that aren't near work. If they are paid to travel, they can't make less than they make on social assistance or they won't do it. Yet because of that, government pays more every year. Sometimes a small investment up front can allow someone to have the dignity of work for the rest of their lives. And having a parent who works can break a cycle for the poverty of the children. And that's why we'll be reforming the social assistance program but it'll be reformed to get action. It'll be reformed so that people can see a future, have a future, and be part of a growing New Brunswick. We apply the rules too rigidly to those who arrive in the system and just need a handout. And because we trap people in the system, we become tolerant of those who have been in the system for years. Because of that expense, we don't give enough help to those who truly cannot work, like people with disabilities. It's time to reform our social safety net to allow more trust and flexibility for people to get work in their first year. If a ride or childcare or a housing subsidy will help people break the welfare trap, we should be empowering social workers to find a solution. Every time I ask where money is being spent, I'm saying, what's the result you're getting from that? I was asked early on about, say, oh, well, where would you cut? I said, I'll cut anywhere that we're not getting results. That shouldn't be a hard thing to do. If we're spending money without results, we should be able to do that. And I'm fortunate to say that our Minister of Finance, Ernie Steves, has the same attitude. Right, Ernie? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was disappointed to learn that the Public Service and Teachers Union and Education Councils all warned government not to move back to entry point for early French immersion back to grade one without studying the results of the last changes. Even the Auditor General pointed this out as well in her last report. We have spent millions more on political change, one that led to fewer children taking immersion, more inequality in classrooms, and more children being taught by teachers without the language skills or teacher training they need. In 2018, 43.7% of grade one students were enrolled in French immersion. We know that fewer than 10% of the children who start an immersion in grade one actually finish the program, less than 10% with bilingual skills. Spending millions to return to a failed system doesn't work for me. When we look at the language tensions in New Brunswick, a lack of bilingual workers in areas like ambulance care, a lack of accessible training for adults, a sense of lost opportunity for many, we can see the results. If our education system teaches bilingualism to only an elite few, without equal opportunity for all, we will never unite this province, and we will continue to debate the language issue in this province. Our goal, <laughs> many jurisdictions worldwide teach all children to, that graduate with conversational skills in two or three or four languages. Why can't we do that for two? That's why the Minister of Education will be working closely with educators, with, with parents, with individuals, uh, stakeholders, to take the politics out of this decision and reach a solution that works for all children. This will be part of our plan to create a world-class education system that empowers teachers, inspires, and innovates, and makes the classroom, once again, an area of learning. Here is something else that may surprise you. We have consistently been above the Canadian average in the number of family doctors per capita. Yet so many can't ex access primary care. About 50,000 individuals without a family doctor. And that's because we don't have a supply problem, but rather a problem with management and distribution. This government is committed to doing away with the outdated billing system, looking at uh, working with health professionals for solutions like nurse practitioner practitioners, looking for ways to improve the system. I've often spoken about the need for government to focus on customer service. Every taxpayer is a customer. 
and we need to improve customer service. People pay taxes with the expectations that deserve to be met. Government is not a business for profit, but it should be a business that delivers better service to its customers, the citizens of this province, the citizens of this province who are taxpayers. If customers do not get the value for their money, they will go elsewhere, and that's exactly what is happening. When I speak of customer service approach, it is because I want us to remember who our social programs exist for. Our health care system is there to provide care to the sick. Our schools are there to inspire children. Our social assistance programs are there to support families and lead them to the dignity of work. Our goal is to get spending under control and get better results from government through managing better, managing smarter. The outputs are not like a business. The goal is people, not profits. But we still have to remember we do indeed have a goal. And that's why I'll keep us focused on people with, who pub, with public services that we're there to serve. That approach mirrors the greater challenge. To fix our social programs for a have-not province, we need to move forward. We have to not ask what we can do, what we can get from them in jobs, what we want more for buildings, but we ask how we can be better meet the goals of serving those in need. Equally so, in our quest to fix our public finances and energize our private economy, we need to ask, what can we do for New Brunswick and not what government can give us more of? That is why I'm so proud to say that even with only two months remaining in the current fiscal year, we will balance the budget in 2018-19, this fiscal year. Thank you very much to the Minister of Finance. And And thank you very much to the colleagues, the deputy ministers, the, the deputy ministers in government, the civil servants that are looking under the hood. And we can say this with confidence because I'm convinced that they're going to deliver the results for New Brunswick. The results that we need because they're part of the solution, a key part of the solution. And it's exciting. I'm also pleased to say here tonight that the, balance, the budget will continue to be balanced. In 1920, well, we can't go beyond that, maybe, we're not sure. Uh, but certainly, for as long as we're here, uh, because that should be a given. shouldn't be an option. It should be a given. I also have the pleasure to tell you that the 1920 budget will also be balanced. We could solve the problem here in New Brunswick with the tremendous workforce that we have in the civil service working for us each and every day. If higher transfer payments do arrive, we will have the happy choice of lowering taxes, paying down the debt, or improving our systems. We need to make it our common mission to have a government that works, an economy that provides opportunity and finances we can sustain. There are three introductions I'd like to make tonight. Tout d'abord, je veux féliciter les étudiants de la Université de Moncton. Let me highlight the accomplishments of students from the University of Moncton who recently won first place in a Canadian University Business Championship. This is a symbol of excellence and a demonstration that we are and can be first in Canada. And there would be many other examples, and we need to find them and make people aware of just how good we can be. They're a reminder that our future depends on keeping young people with big dreams and bright futures right here in New Brunswick. Monsieur le Recteur Couturier, s'il vous plaît. Mr. Couturier, please give our congratulations to your students. I would also like to like you to meet, I'm not sure where they are, two individuals that I'm aware know, Harry Cross and Donald Ian Shaw. Another individual is Ken Gould. I'll tell you for a moment, Ken Gould is unable to be here tonight. But I'm recognizing these three individuals because they are recognized by the Red Cross for donating blood over 900 times each. So any of you that have had blood transfusions, you should say thank you. And I think they're at 940 right now, currently. They remind us of the big citizenship that we need. Without citizens willing to give, no amount of spending and no amount of doctors could provide the care we need. Thank you very much, gentlemen.
That's the sense of a shared mission we want to inspire. That's the big citizenship our times demand. We need all hands on deck approach. Every single New Brunswicker can be part of the solution. Business owners, academic leaders, union representatives, and individuals from all walks of life. Too often we measure people by what they get out of government. We tell our union leaders to get us a sal gets us salary hikes. We expect mayors and MLAs to build arenas and pave roads. We expect leaders to demand our share from government, even if it shrinks the pie for others. If we all focus only on getting our share, we will be fighting more and more over less and less. Under Brunswick, where fewer talented young people stay, where businesses close because taxes are too high, where we fund entitlements, even as a basic service goes unfunded, that won't be a province worth fighting for. But New Brunswick is worth fighting for. Mais cela vaut le pain de se battre pour le New Brunswick. New Brunswick is worth fighting for. Help us by reforming the system to find the money for wage hikes. If you're a mayor, ask first how we can lift the tide for every community in this province. If you're an opposition politician, lead with ideas, not complaints. If you're an entrepreneur, tell us what you need to take a risk and build your business. If you're a citizen, ask how you can help build your community, lift people out of poverty, and help a child learn. My former Deputy Minister of Finance, my first Deputy Minister of Finance, when I was first elected in 2010, John Mallory is here tonight. Now, John and I didn't actually hit it off when we first met. Uh, he had seen a lot of me come and go. Uh, he'd been in the system 38, 40 years. And, and he said, you know, I, I know how to deal with you guys. Really, he was that frank about it all. And I didn't know quite how to handle it. And you know, people have said, you know, that I hate to spend a dollar. And, and uh, well, some of that's true. Um, but actually, in John's case, I've spent $2. John has a two-year contract to work with us to help and work with the civil service to help us get their fiscal order or situation back under control. John retired, but he hasn't drawn from the mission to come back and help where he could. And of course, in typical government fashion, we, we drew up a $1 a year contract with an 18-page contract. <laughs> so John once told me, Blaine, our problems will be solved when a government decides it's more important to fix New Brunswick than to be reelected. And that sums up our mission. And John, we're glad to have you back because that's our goal. Now, I'm not saying we don't want to be reelected. I'm just saying our focus is to fix government. And I believe you do what's right. You get the job done. You have results that prove it. People will recognize you for it, and you'll keep going. And that's what makes the difference. We're a government here today because 25 MLAs could not be bought. They've chosen politics, they chose politics second, province first. And my goal is to have 49 MLAs with that very same view. We're here to get the job done. That's why we're elected. And we close tonight. As we close tonight, I want to give you my word as a Premier, and on behalf of our government, that we will continue to put this province's needs and future above all else. There will be political pressures to put ribbon cuttings before results, but not on my watch. There will be calls to take the easy way out by raising your taxes, but not on my watch. Some will tell us to start, to start spending as the election draws near, and our answer will always be, not on my watch. There will be voices who will demand backroom deals for special interests, or that or that will want a special interest, not on my watch. Voices will urge us to go back to the safety of buying votes with taxpayers' money, not on my watch. There's a theme here, you can join in. There will be those who try to divide us, to pit region against region, north against south, but not on my watch. Some will even tell us to lower expectations, to settle for less than big dreams with a strong economy, but not on my watch. Wherever you are tonight, I ask you to join me. When people tell us that New Brunswick's best days are behind us, raise your voices and to say, not on my watch, because I'm going to be part of raising New Brunswick, and I'm going to be part of bringing our province back on the map. And people are going to say, what happened to New Brunswick? New Brunswick's on the move. Thank you so much for being here tonight and being part of this. Thank you.
may have blown that. It's such a, an amazing province to live in and to work in. And we believe that there's a tremendous opportunity to grow uh, our global seafood business from right here in New Brunswick. Uh, donc on n'a pas nécessairement une motivation directe à faire de, du marketing ou de la publicité à l'intérieur de la province. We like the predictability of the market. We think there's opportunity here. All you have to do is find them and capitalize on them. to tap into the global marketplace and find out what consumers want right here in New Brunswick and deliver a product that sits on the shelf in thousands and thousands of stores. Uh, on l'a vu dernièrement même encore dans les journaux, uh, c'est un endroit où uh, les gens considèrent qu'il fait bon vivre. New Brunswickers are hard-working, resilient, innovative people that have a way of getting things done even in the most challenging of circumstances. La province du New Brunswick a beaucoup à offrir. On est une province qui a un créneau particulier étant officiellement bilingue aussi. It's a place where a handshake still means something. It's a place where the people you do business with are the people you go see at the market or you sit beside at your kids' little league game. When we look at New Brunswick, we have a lot of hope a lot of passion to continue to grow our business from New Brunswick. We're all here and we're not leaving because this is where we want to be and this is where we want to grow our business. We're now selling to 67 countries around the world from right here in New Brunswick and that gives us a great deal of pride and a great deal of optimism. We're doing our part for the New Brunswick economy by reinvesting our profits back into the province. We're doing our part for the New Brunswick economy by exporting around the world. Nanoptics amène de la nouvelle eau au moulin parce qu'on exporte 98% à l'extérieur du Canada. We're doing our part for the New Brunswick economy by hiring New Brunswickers, bringing jobs when we acquire other companies back here at home, and we plan to invest millions into the New Brunswick economy over the next number of years. Check. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we're not quite finished. The Premier has agreed to a little chat, uh, some questions and answers with Krista. So, veuillez vous patienter pour un bout, mesdames et messieurs. We'd ask you just to stick around. We just have this final moment here, so we turn things over to uh, Krista, Krista and our Premier Higgs. So, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your attention this evening. We thank you, Premier Higgs, for delivering the 45th annual State of the Province Address. We are proud to have hosted this address. It's our premier event for the last 45 years. And we've been talking to our members, and our members are really pleased that you've agreed to let us pose some of their questions to you after this evening's presentation. So tonight, both in your speech and in this video, you highlighted that you believe the private sector needs to do our part. What does doing our part look like? Well, I think, as you can see, for a long time, uh, there's investment's been, you know, kind of unaware or, or concerned about the state of the province and basically saying, you know, if, if government is just going to throw our money away, then how would I dare invest in New Brunswick? And I want to clearly demonstrate, I hope I've done that tonight, that we're not going to throw your money away. We're going to provide the very same principles that you apply to your business. So what we need from businesses, we, we need you to come back with your investment. We need you to tell us that, you know, what are the concerns you have with regulations, with things that are preventing you from succeeding or expanding your business. And then we want to be a partner in helping you to expand internationally, not only provincially. So I'm just saying those roadblocks, those barriers that you've always thought were here in New Brunswick, well, they're here, we're here to remove them. So you, uh, you tell us what they are and, and we will work on a timeline to, to take them down. Thank you. <laughs> In order to balance the budget that you've just promised us this evening, um, your government's going to have to make some very difficult decisions. You already did in the capital budget. Um, I think our audience tonight agreed uh, and their applause showed that they too feel the urgency, they support that decision. How do you think the people of New Brunswick are behind you? Do you think they're ready to support difficult decisions? Yes, I do think that. I think the, the capital budget, you know, it wasn't easy, uh, but it basically illustrates, you know, we just can't create employment through taxpayer funding and, and creating jobs in that regard. 
Um, I think that if they see, uh, again, when we say, what, what are the opportunities? Uh, I'm encouraged that, that people are, are basically saying, uh, how can I help? What can I do? Where can I, where can I contribute? And um, so the, the decisions coming ahead, I don't think are going to be as difficult as one may think. I think that when you get everybody in their own way, whether it be in a hospital, it be in a school, everyone sees places and say, oh, why does government keep doing this? And one area that I would speak of right now, typically we have what was called like a March Madness thing where people say, I've got to spend my budget or I won't get it next year. If every department throughout the civil service said, you know what, I don't need to spend more in March, I don't need to spend more in February, I can manage with what I have, we would balance the budget just on that alone. So it's a case of asking people to think about what they do every day and the contribution they can make. And you know it won't be tough, because I can't do this alone. But together, every one of us doing our part, we can make a huge difference and people will see it and be part of a, a revolution in New Brunswick that's putting us back under control. Tonight you mentioned in your speech that your government is going to continue to fight the federal carbon backstop that's being imposed on New Brunswick. What does the fight look like? What are your next steps? Well, we currently are interveners in the court case with Saskatchewan and Ontario. Uh, we will also challenge it on our own court case. We, uh, I have meetings federally next week, meeting with the Prime Minister, uh, meeting with Dominic Laval. Uh, he and I are close, as most of you know. Um, <laughs> so we, we, we will be uh, having a, a good discussion on, on how this is unfair across the country. It, the standards are different. I mentioned the example. I mean, we, they are imposing this at a, in, in this year, come April. And, and there, isn't an, there isn't a logic behind it. I mean, what is our end goal? Our end goal should be meeting our emission targets, and we're going to do that. So, so there isn't a need to do more than that to tax people more. So I'll stay tuned. We'll see how the meetings go next week. But, um, but I'm looking forward to, uh, we'll, we'll do what we have to fight it. The business community of New Brunswick is extremely opposed to Bill 9 that was introduced in the fall sitting of the legislature for its first reading. That bill would see machinery and equipment tax added to property tax. We understand that you are against this bill. We've called for a comprehensive review of the property tax system to address a system that in some cases unfairly penalizes businesses. What's your intention? So I, I agree with the full assessment of the property tax system. I mean, we have talked and, and working with, with our colleagues to discuss you know, the, the double taxation and, and, and dealing with that. So my goal really is to have a fair taxation system that doesn't penalize our companies, doesn't penalize our businesses, and we look across other provinces and we look at where we're competing and say how are we advantaged or disadvantages. My goal is not simply to impose a new tax on someone for the sake of trying to generate revenue for, for likely a situation where the spending's got out of control and it's, it's, it's not going to solve the problem. It's only going to mask it. So let's go to the root cause of any of these issues, but let's have a, a property tax reform that meets what others have, what can, can make a comparison, so we don't disadvantage our businesses. That's my goal. And where that takes us, it'll be very open, it'll be very readily available and transparent, so people will know the decisions made for the right reason. Thank you. You also talked about natural gas development in your speech. What do you see as the biggest opportunities for New Brunswick in terms of natural resource development in addition to natural gas? So we know, right, well, I guess right now, looking at other areas, and we talk about the, we had a, a talking about the blue economy. So that's in the agriculture world and, and what opportunities exist there. We talk about, you know, in the, in the, in the farming and land-based, land-based agriculture. Uh, we, we, I met a, um, a farmer from, from India who's, who's located outside of Bhaktush and bought the old tobacco plantations. And he's, pla and he's, uh, he's actually growing apples. And, and he has about 1,000 acres. And he was told that he couldn't do that here in New Brunswick. And, and he's, a, he's a private investor, he did it on his own, and, and he's going to be exporting like a million apples in the next five years to, to France and, and, um, and Germany. And, and he said, I was actually told that I couldn't do that here in New Brunswick. You know, so how many times do we get told we can't do that here in New Brunswick? So, so when I look at opportunities, there are people that, you know, hops is another area that's potential uh, that's for us. There's, there's so many things that we have convinced ourselves that we can't do here in New Brunswick. Well, I don't agree with that. And there's, we, we want to, our opportunities in New Brunswick, I mean, the goal has to be not only, you know, looking for big corporations, but looking for those niche opportunities that are right for New Brunswick. And I've challenged opportunities in New Brunswick to do just that. We set up a portfolio for Business New Brunswick with the Minister Wilson, you know, to, to look and help small businesses and help them find areas to succeed. We have an opportunity, and we have, as I've pointed out in the speech, an urgency to get it done. 
-hmm. Over the years, uh, especially the past few years, New Brunswick businesses have faced many increases in operating costs, huge jumps in work safe rates, the introduction of a new holiday, CPP premiums, HST increase, amongst others. The cumulative effect has really impacted the competitiveness of New Brunswick businesses. How are you going to use a business lens to ensure that future decisions don't impact our competitiveness? Well, we already demonstrated the sense of urgency with the WorkSafe premiums. I mean, we reacted very quickly. I remember the discussions uh, with the board talking about doing, putting this in place. And the discussion went around, well, next year we could bring in legislation and all that. And this was back in November, about a week or two after we were sworn in. And the question was, well, why, why next year? Why, we're back in the House in December. Why aren't we doing it in December? Well, that's kind of tight, you know. Well, no, it wasn't tight. We just get on with it. And so the point is, how many other things are like that? So I, I've said no new taxes uh, that go back into government coffers, because that, that's not our goal. Our goal is to work with the money we have. And our goal is to find ways to reduce the cost of the business operations, reduce the cost of personal taxes, so people will feel like investing in our province. And so I, I see great opportunities to do that. And our, our, uh, the last resort for me is, is how, do we, how do we charge you more money? The goal is you tell us what's preventing you from being as, as good as you can be. So I guess as a follow-up to that, when you're thinking about transparency, would your government be prepared to publicly release economic impact studies uh, on decisions that could affect economic viability of business in the province? Yes. That's easy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, the Chamber views post-secondary education and our world-class institutions as a key economic driver, um, a hub of innovation, one of the best places to get an actual return on investment. What's your vision for the future of post-secondary education? Right now, when I look at the challenges, and I mentioned 120,000 in terms of uh, over the next 10 years needing those spaces, and I've met with, uh, with post-secondary education group already. And we've talked about this. We talked about it with, uh, with uh, in relation to the number of people in social assistance. How many can we get into the system with the number of immigration? So we know the target. We know how many jobs are going to be lost just from retiring. So we know that challenge. So then, why should this be difficult? We need so many every year. Whether that comes from from education, from from MBCC, from the UNB, from other universities, colleges. Uh, CCMB, whether it comes from any of those sources or whether it comes from, from immigration, we know the challenge. So I want to get on a schedule and I want to see the departments pull together the, the actual program for the next 10 years. We know the challenge. Every year we need this many people and we need them here, here, and here, and here. So that can be visible and we can start showing that and tracking it and we'll expect departments to, to deliver on it. Because sitting and talking about it with another study is just another way for more procrastination. When you talk about those 120,000 jobs that will need to be filled and you talk about immigration as being part of it, what does your government plan to do um, to help support immigration efforts connecting employers with newcomers? You know, when I travel around the province, so it's a federal program, but I think we can certainly influence it. So I, I, I don't, I, I think there's a huge opportunity there. When I travel around the province, if I looked at a, a business like Cook's Agriculture, they had, a, they have a need for 70 people. And they say at any one time, they could be up to 100. But they had 70 when I met with them two, uh, about two, three months ago. When I go up to Shivagon, they had the same problem, can't get people. The Northwest in the, in the poultry business can't get people. So I think we're, we're missing a boat here in terms of when we bring immigrants in. You can't be one-offs that come into a community. And it was mentioned here tonight earlier, I think a very appropriate point. We need to be more welcoming. It's hard to keep people into, people into the community. So maybe we need to be looking at bringing in blocks of 10 or 20, a family, to move into an area with a job. So then it is a home. They integrate into our society, but they integrate with their families. Because right now, that's difficult when you come into a whole new world. And, and I, I thought the comment was very appropriate in, in their challenge in that regard. Mm -hmm. I want to turn your attention to a reference in your speech. Um, you talked about us having the highest number of do doctors per capita in the country. Um, and you said that in the election campaign, you said that you were going to eliminate um, geographic-based billing numbers. So when is that change going to come into effect? This year, when we bring the legislature back in and uh, to move that forward, it's, uh, 
you know, it's, it's a management system, as I talked about. You know, there could be areas that don't have, uh, and we've used the billing number system as a management tool for years to restrict the, the number of doctors. We're the only province in the country that does that. So you say, well, okay, let's look at, look, look at uh, doctor-patient uh, workload, look at where the geographic uh, locations are, look at how we match up with other provinces. You know, sometimes we, we, we get into an issue because we each want our own specialist. And in New Brunswick, you know, if you, if you look at Halifax and you talk about Halifax, you can say, well, where do you go in Nova Scotia? And some many people from New Brunswick end up going to Halifax for different things. Well, where should we decide in New Brunswick? Where should our, our locations be for the right specialist? And I don't know what that is. But per capita, we need to have those frank discussions and say, what do we need? As a medical society, we need your help. What do we need for coverage for a province our size? And then let's work towards that. Let's not fight between communities. Let's find a way to provide the best health care because uh, the challenge is real. And our biggest challenge is going to be able to fill positions. You know, we can argue about hiring people, but it's finding people to hire. Last year, uh, during the election campaign, you also pledged to reduce the double tax rate uh, by 50% over four years. And the goal would be to eliminate it entirely. Um, is it your intention to begin this process when the first budget in March? Well, I said we'd do it when we had the financial capability to do it. And um, so, you know, we won't be flush first of March. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> into March. So I'll have to talk with the finance department and discuss this further. But, but I know that it's, a, it's an item. It's not only an item for us as a party, but it's an item for other parties as well. And, uh, and we do want to get back to a fair taxation. So it is a commitment. And we will follow through. But our goal will be to do it through a balanced budget approach. Premier, we really appreciate you taking these questions. These are important questions to the business community. Um, I, I would like to, however, give you a chance to have the last word. Well, thank you, Krista. I don't get that at home. <laughs> um, I, do. <laughs> it's, I do, actually. I have a very loving and understanding wife, don't I? Need? Uh, <laughs> so, so that's, you know, what uh, you met for 41 years of marriage. You learn how to act. The, um, I, I guess what I want you to take away from tonight's session is that we have a sense of urgency. This is not business as usual in the province. We have an opportunity. And I'm hoping that as you leave here tonight, every one of you is going to say, what can I do in what I do every day to help New Brunswick? So when I talk about not on my watch, it's not on our watch. Because 20 years, 30 years from now, we're going to say, what did I do to turn New Brunswick around? I really think we're at a turning point. And, and I think the opportunity for us to, to move forward in a constructive way is very, very real. We are going to meet our challenges to avoid a downgrade and avoid additional interest payments. That's why I'm so focused on that. I don't want to pay money for nothing. But let's be part of this. I'm doing this now. My wife and I are doing this now because we want to do our part and feel that our province gave us a wonderful life and still is. And I want my kids to enjoy that and your kids to enjoy that. So think about the sense of urgency. Think about being part of it, and let's rebuild New Brunswick together. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude our evening. Um, we thank you for your attendance. We thank our Premier for delivering the State of the Province. Um, a donation is made to the Fredericton Chamber Scholarship in your name. Uh, we'd like to thank our great MC, Marshall Button. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, the great staff here at the Convention Centre, uh, Siemens, of course. And we'd also like to thank the viewers at home for joining us this evening on broadcast, uh, broadcast on Rogers. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we've just completed the State of the Province and we're very happy to have the Premier here with us. Premier, how do you feel after delivering the 45th annual State of the Province Address with the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce? Excited. We, um, you know, I, I think the, uh, the opportunity is, is clear, uh, clearly in front of us and, and I, uh, I hope that I, I covered topics tonight that people look at not only as real, um, because they, they, they are, 
but also um, the opportunity for them to help make the difference here in the province. I've said from the very beginning that you know it isn't about any any um, one government coming in with with all the solutions because in fact they, they, they that won't be ever be the case. It's about finding a way to uh, demonstrate a, a better behavior politically so that we can uh, feel people uh, people will feel like they want to be part of a, a solution. And so I'm excited. I mean this is obviously was a a business audience and kind of the world I came from, so it, it made it maybe easier in that sense. Mm -hmm. But um, I know that in every corner of the province there are solutions and, and I'm looking to find them. So tonight you made a key announcement about the March 19th budget. How did you think that the audience responded to that announcement and how do you think that the citizenry of New Brunswick will respond? Well, I would like to think, certainly the audience tonight, it would be, it would be um, you know, pretty, pretty important and, and a key factor in, in what they would hope to hear. So I think, uh, but I'd like to think that same message across the province because it's, it's, it's being relieved that, that finally, you know, someone's taking it seriously uh, about how we spend the money that, that, that we're collecting through taxes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the other aspect of this is uh, the goal here from the beginning is that we, we do not want to downgrade. And, and we cannot afford to downgrade and pay another 30, 40 million in interest payments. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the goal from the start with capital budget and then with this is saying, you know, we are going to manage our finances appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to do what we would ask anyone else to do every day in their life. And, and you can't expect people to do things that you yourself aren't prepared to do. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I didn't get in this to, um, you know, for a career in politics. I, I got in this to, to, to make a difference, but to help give people a voice in what's needed to, to turn our province and turn the corner. And I'd like to think tonight people felt that this was a, this was a beginning of a, of a change for New Brunswick that's going to put us on the map in a positive way. Mm -hmm. I do think the response tonight was, was positive and, and the community uh, at large hopefully will, will uh, engage the same way. Okay. What was the key message that you hope that New Brunswickers took away from the State of the Province address this evening? Well, firstly, you know, we have a sense of urgency. Uh, the, the, in, interestingly enough, uh, traveling around the province and, and meeting with, uh, you know, various business owners, but also then getting in government and meeting with the different departments. There's a very common denominator here that we are, we are severely lacking uh, in, in uh, employees in our, in our province. And, and of course, it's most notable in, in the healthcare fields um, and in the uh, educational fields. And, and then through the businesses, it, it's noticeable they, they just can't find employees mm -hmm. to work. You know, and, and I, I, talk about, I talked about it tonight. E even with uh, 36,000 people in social assistance, what opportunity do we have for training and, and breaking the cycle and so people feel good about, uh, you know, moving forward and see a future in our province? Uh, how do we break that cycle of, of parents saying, you know, you've got to go somewhere else to, to work? Mm -hmm. um, you know, people say, well, I'm okay, I can survive, but, but my kids, they'll need to go somewhere else. I never had that view when I, when I graduated. Um, it wasn't even an option I was considering to move outside of the province. I want to bring that back and I think that people are leaving tonight with, you know, we can fix this. And, um, and I, I'm excited about that potential. And so it's like, uh, I feel like we're all uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a watch now and we're all saying, you know, I can't wait for someone else to do something for me. It's like, what can I do? So the whole theme about, you know, talking about the sense of urgency, fixing New Brunswick, um, not on my watch, um, and the not on my watch theme is uh, we're all here, we're all watching, mm -hmm. let's, let's do more than watch. Mm -hmm. We all need to row in the same direction. We do. So you've now officially been the Premier for 83 days. And counting. Um, <laughs> what's been your biggest surprise and, and what do you feel has been the biggest challenge? Well, surprise would be probably related to the, the information that we learned and related to the carbon tax mm -hmm. and, the, and the, um, the carbon plan that was put forward or not. Um, it was known by the federal government and basically was the federal government had advised the province that the plan would not be accepted. There was this, this uh, shuffling of money from, from one box to the other wasn't going to be accepted as, as a plan. So that was a disappointment that all this was known and here, here we were at the, at the 11th hour and, and inheriting a, a situation that had a clear timeline. So then the other part was, uh, that was kind of encouraging was the departments and they'd, had, they'd worked on a uh, carbon plan with, with different um, stakeholders and, and, um, and, and it was in, in a good format. It was good. It just needed to be finished off and, and we did that and submitted it. And, and the only real difference outside of, of um, what the federal government are looking for is that we don't believe in a carbon tax. We don't believe that we have to tax people more 
to, to um, ensure we meet our emissions. And the unfairness that we saw from one industry to another because the baselines are all different. So those, that was a, a real big issue. I mean, of course, the, the, the issue around the Francophony Games, that was a you know, surprise, and, and that was something well known too, and, and so that was a concern. Um, the, uh, those items were, were bigger ones. And then looking at the money, money that's been spent and working with the department, saying, well, what did we get out of that? Mm -hmm. And not being able to get a clear answer. Mind you, that's what the budget process is for right now and what we're going through. Where's the money been spent? So in the first 83 days, you know, we've uh, we reacted on some files. The WorkSafe um, was was a big one to to put that legislation in place because those rates were getting out of hand, and we'll continue to do that. Um, I want us to be uh, not only seen but to be be felt by businesses, by individuals who ask a question of government. I want them to get an answer, and when when I get a letter. Uh, I want people to go to the right department and give give the individuals an answer or call or deal with it, but don't don't just send out a you know, kind of a template of a response. Mm -hmm. When you talk about uh, business responding to some of the things your government is doing and has done uh, early in your mandate, how do you think being from the business uh, background that you have has prepared you for this position? Well, I, I think the career, you know, of, of um, being uh, in, in having various exposures over 30 some years, is has been of great benefit. You know, so so not only in, in business acumen that that basically you have to find ways to be creative and innovative, in order to to um, you just can't charge customers more money. So you look at ways to to um, do your job and do it better, mm -hmm. like every business would do. Mm -hmm. And when people say to me, "Well, government's not a business," I, I say, "Well, it's not a business to, to for profit." But it is a business to get better results. There's no excuse for us not to get better results every day uh, in delivering service for the money being spent. And it's not a matter of just, I need more money, so I'll tax somebody more. It's saying, why can't I do this differently? Or why can't I do it better? And that's so the, the part of um, getting people trained, having a succession plan in government, just mm -hmm. like you would in business. Mm -hmm. So another thing that I you know, came from the business world, I hired my replacement um, three years before I, before I left. And, and we need to have that continuity in the system. People see their career path, they feel engaged to deliver, and it doesn't get thwarted uh, in such an um, uh, irresponsible way, one political party after the next. Mm -hmm. And we need to get on a program of continuous improvement, just like a business. Mm -hmm. So there's so many categories that you just keep building on each other's success. You don't just turf what the last one did and start again. And that, that sort of background makes me look at things very differently than, than most. And you know, I never came here to get into this uh, for for a, a political career. I just mm -hmm. see it's a it's it's a mission that mm -hmm. I feel like I'm on now with with many others who are, mm -hmm. have shown the same um, diligence, the same interest, mm -hmm. the same conviction. So I guess that that leads me to what will be my final question. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, what do you hope that your legacy will be as the 34th Premier of New Brunswick? I am hoping that we have an organization throughout New Brunswick that are focused um, on, on, on common goals to build a better New Brunswick. So in other words, you know, we see a healthcare system that's being continually monitored and, and with best, best in class practices and governments when they come in they're presented a, uh, you know, kind of here's, here's where we're going in healthcare and here's why. Here's where we're going in education. These are the standards that are good. These are the ones that aren't working. And the departments take ownership for the results. I'm hoping we have a, a, a real uh, succession plan in the system where people's careers are being developed and, and being nurtured like, like you would in any business. Um, I'd like to think that, that the attitude that people have uh, for the taxes they pay, they feel like they're getting a service level that, that, is, that is worthy of the money being spent. So they, they feel like I, I'm not uh, irresponsible, um, politicians aren't irresponsible, they're not blowing money out the door for, for votes, they're, they're making decisions with facts. So I'm just trying to bring accountability in the system in real terms, and and uh, and because uh, nothing, it won't all get fixed in the time that I'm here, and the time it'll take it'll take years. But if we're on a path for improvement, and we have very clear reporting structures so people in outside see it, I'm hoping we get a whole different view of how we can participate together to get a better province. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for delivering the State of the Province this evening. Thank you for um, having this interview with me after the evening that we've had. And thank you to you this evening for tuning in and joining us this evening for the State of the Province Address. Have a good evening. <laughs>